uh, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Dear Father God, we come together this day to seek your wisdom, guidance, courage, and strength. Help us to make wise decisions for the good of all those who have placed their trust and confidence in our leadership. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> At this time, can we call the uh, workshop to order, please? Yes, sir. Uh, directors, we have uh, Blakely Fernandez, who's a general counsel for the authority. She'll be um, presenting the annual ethics and compliance training. Thank you. Good evening. As Pilar said, I'm Blakely Fernandez. I am with the law firm of Bracewell um, out of San Antonio. This is a training that we are required to do each year under TxDOT's guidelines um, as adopted by the Transportation Commission. And so this applies to the board and staff. And we appreciate the staff being here this evening as well. Um, all right, I'm gonna run through the presentation relatively quickly, but if you've got questions and that applies behind me too, just um, speak up and I will um, endeavor to answer those. But otherwise, I'm going to kind of keep moving quickly. So let me know if there's something you want to spend more time on. So under the Transportation Commission's rules in the Administrative Code, RMAs are required to adopt and enforce an internal ethics and compliance program. This applies to the board and to the staff. And the goal of the program is to detect and prevent violations of the law, compliance with the program, institute monitoring and auditing systems, and provide periodic training for the board and employees, which is what we're doing this evening. So to help in our conversation, we're gonna look at the, the terms quickly. Ethics addresses the conduct and behavior that goes towards the public trust in order to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Compliance is more of the, the tangible offset of that, the evidence and enforcement related to the the ethics obligations that we have. We're gonna talk about seven key areas this evening. And for each of those, we're gonna look first at the state law and then at the TxDOT rules and the RMA policies. So if you've served on other boards and commissions, you're gonna be more familiar with the state laws, but TxDOT uh, restricts even further some of those concepts. And then in some cases, the RMA has elected to adopt even further restrictions. So we'll start with conflicts of interest. This slide here applies primarily to board members. Um, under state law, board members should not participate on a vote or a matter involving a business entity or property in which you have a substantial business or property interest and might receive an economic benefit. So what I wanna highlight for you um, on this slide is that these thresholds are lower than you might expect. A substantial business interest is 10% of voting shares, 10% of your total income or $15,000 in fair market value. A substantial property interest under state law is considered the value of $2,500 or more. Should you find yourself in a, a conflict that meets these thresholds, your obligation is to not vote or deliberate on that matter. You disclose the conflict and we'll keep a record of it. Um, and again, this applies to those in voting and decision-making authority, primarily the board. The TxDOT and RMA rules in the Transportation Code are much more broad. So you'll see here um, that I've highlighted a lot of mites and coulds. So this is a much more sub subjective standard. And um, I wanna run through these because this is pretty critical. Um, under the RMA rules, there should be no acceptance or solicitation of any gift, favor, or service that might influence official duties. No employment, business, or professional activity that might require or induce the disclosure of the RMA's confidential information. No employment or compensation that could impair the independence of judgment. No personal investments, including your spouse, that could create a conflict with the RMA. No solicitation or acceptance of any benefit for the exercise of official duties. No performance of official duties in favor of another. And no personal interest in any RMA agreement. And just, so the, just to be clear, everything yes, that's sir. happening in this meeting is to the uh, Public Information Open Meetings Act, correct? Yes. Okay, yeah. So, um, and, and we'll go through that okay. as one of these seven categories. 
Um, so the responsibility of the official, and again, this and, and this section we're talking about governmental officials, officials, so the directors and employees. Um, you really want to think of these rules and the way they impact um, lunches, dinners, trips with vendors. You know, you can't do anything that would be perceived to influence decisions. No sharing of RMA confidential information. That's anything not yet available to the public. Of course, no purchase of land in or near projected right away and no interest in RMA contracts. The RMA rules um, have additional conflict of interest discussion related to eligibility for service. Um, this slide applies primarily to directors and the executive director, but you'll see here, and, and you've all signed a certificate when you were appointed to this effect, but. Um, that you don't qualify for service on the RMA board or as an executive director if you're employed or manage an entity or organization other than a political subdivision that's regulated by or receives funds from TxDOT, the RMA, or the county. Um, if you directly or indirectly own or control more than 10% of a business entity or other organization that's regulated by or receives funds from TxDOT, the RMA, or the county. If you use or receive a substantial amount of tangible goods, services, or funds from TxDOT, the RMA, or the county, or finally, if you're required to register as a lobbyist because of your activities for compensation on behalf of a profession related to the operation of TxDOT, the RMA, or the county. So these would these are, are issues which would need to be disclosed, but if a conflict exists in this case, you would be ineligible to serve on the board. This here, the conflicts of interest disclosure statement you see here is the chapter 171 statement um, this is, is used by all local and state governmental entities, um, and that's what vendors will fill out when they're applying for RMA contracts. We also have a board ethics and compliance um, certificate. That's what you're going to sign tonight, and that's going to go through all of these requirements and verify that you're eligible to serve and that you understand all of these obligations. If a conflict comes up during the term of your service, if a vendor who's not currently a vendor but applies later and, and it triggers one of these uh, one of these issues, the contractor will have an opportunity to file a disclosure statement and so will you. And so it's not a big deal. We just disclose it and you don't vote on it, but it is something we've got to keep track of. All right. The second area we're going to talk about is bribery and gifts. that it could be considered bribery. So the bribery statute applies to all public servants. So that's all the employees and the board members. Um, and so it's something that we, we wanna be aware of and mindful that, that no one trips over these rules. State law has exceptions, let's see. think have we lost battery in this um can you just down to the next slide yes I should have page number just one slide down well so there are exceptions to the bribery statute for non-cash items for token items um, Generally things that do not have a value of more of $25, the kind of things you might get at a conference or a dinner, food, transportation, and lodging, um, gifts from friends or relatives and business associations, and payments for legitimate consideration. I want to highlight that the tech stop rules differ on food, transportation, and lodging. Um, typically, if someone takes you to dinner, takes you to an event, that's not considered bribery as long as they're with you to enjoy the tickets together. 
TxDOT does not permit that. They, they limit the food transportation and lodging to reimbursement for food, travel, or lodging to an official event in an honorarium that can only be in the form of a meal served at an official transportation related event. And so uh, by virtue of being a part of the RMA, you're subject to those stricter rules. Okay, the next topic is use of government property. Computers and software, including email systems, um, are all considered government property. Um, I think now we've got more employees, we've got more vehicles and more traditional government property. And we just wanna be mindful that any abuse of um, or misuse of that property is considered a violation of state law. For board members, you don't really have access to much equipment from the RMA. So this would apply to you in terms of um, really information is what you've got that's most valuable. So any abuse of information that you get through the RMA using confidential information or sharing that, um, that could be a misuse of government property. All right, I'm sorry y'all aren't seeing this, but you could imagine. We're now moving on to nepotism. Um, this again applies primarily to board members. Under state law, you may not vote or on the appointment of an individual to a paid position if the individual is related to the public official within the third degree of consanguinity or the second degree of affinity. This is, you've got one employee that you appoint and that's the executive director. If, um, if it, after Pilar's gone, if you wanna hire somebody else, just make sure he's not related to anybody on the board. Um, and I can help you untangle that if it's a distant relative. All right. The next area is open government. I think that you've probably all done your open government training, your um, Public Information Act and Open Meetings Act training. And we appreciate that. The Open Meetings Act um, applies to notice requirements, how you conduct open meetings, when closed sessions are permissible, and conducting meetings by teleconference or video conference, and then of course the penalties or remedies under the Act. With regard to open government, all meetings of a governmental body are open unless the law provides an exception. Um, that could be a regular or a special called meeting. An open meeting is considered a meeting that's accessible to the public, so it needs to be within Hidalgo County and accessible to individuals with disabilities, provide for public comment, and then we've got uh, more recent requirements for internet broadcasting of meetings. All meetings that are open require public notice. That's date, time, place, and subject posting. Um, the subject requires enough specificity to be actual notice to the public. And we'll discuss it a little more on the next slide, but there was recently a case um, brought in Amarillo that has changed kind of what we consider adequate posting. So when you're talking about financial matters or, um, or, or matters of, of more meaningful consequence to the public, the Amarillo case says you've got to make an effort to put more detail in the actual agenda language. So sometimes we've allowed the backup to the agenda to provide that detail. In Amarillo, the issue was, um, was issuing debt and the way they were going to structure the debt, but they didn't have the amount in the agenda um, and they didn't describe the structure that they were entering into. And so the court said that wasn't enough notice and, and it made their actions void. And so that's a, that's a, big consequence when you're trying to move through a financial transaction. So something that, that Celia and Pilar and I will be mindful of on your behalf. All right, if we can move down two or three more slides. I'm at open government. What is a public meeting? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so a public meeting requires a quorum, that's four board members. So we've got that tonight with the three of you here and an RMA is allowed to have telephonic participation. So we've got um, Mr. Renya on the phone. Discussion of RMA's business. This could occur in a public hearing, a county workshop. It doesn't have to be in this room or a designated RMA meeting. If there are four of you and you're discussing RMA business, you're creating a meeting and then we've got to go backwards and think about you know are you creating it in a way that meets the open meetings requirements the the trickiest way um, for board members i think to get tripped up by this is in emails and text messages if you're emailing 
and that, that email starts to generate conversation with more than four of you or with four of you, um, that can create an open meeting and be a violation of the act. And then what's called polling board members. So if one board member is checking in to make sure that four agree on something or, um, or disagree on something, then, then you could create what's called a walking forum. And so we wanna be very mindful that we don't do that. Um, a violation of, of the Open Meetings Act could be that an action is voidable, but some of these issues, the walking quorums or some of the intentional violations of the Open Meetings Act could be criminal in nature. So what's not a public meeting? Um, it's established that social settings, holiday parties, um, conventions, chamber dinners, these things are not considered public meetings. Press conference is not a public meeting, groundbreakings, um, candidate forums, and so forth. When you are at those kind of social events, though, you want to be mindful that you're not sitting in a group of four and you're not discussing RMA's business. So let's see, we covered walking quorum. Closed session, if we could go down one more slide. The exception to the open meetings requirement are closed sessions. And the headings on the left here cover the primary areas why this board would go into closed session. Uh, most likely is consultation with an attorney, but we do go in for real property issues, um, security devices, personnel from time to time, um, and audits. And so um, on the closed session, members of the board are all welcome to come unless you've got a conflict on that item and then you would not want to participate. Um, the attorney is typically there. You can have other consultants that work for you. Um, you could have your financial advisor, you could have your GEC, if they've got pertinent information to that closed session topic. You can't have third party arm's length uh, folks. So sometimes you've got someone who's proposing a contract, they wanna come and talk about their contract terms. That's, that's not okay. It can only be sort of our side of the aisle that can come into closed session. We operate closed sessions with a certified agenda rather than a recording. Um, and so you, we keep track of the items that we discuss. It's signed by the chair or whoever's the acting chair of that closed session and it's kept on file at the RMA office. That's a legal requirement that actually belongs to you, but the staff and I manage that. Um, but it is your obligation to not participate in a closed session that's not recorded or doesn't have a certified agenda. And that's, that's unfortunately the way the law is drafted there. No final action is taken in executive session. You can just get, gather information. All final action has to occur back in the main session. All right, so um, final on open government, it's the responsibility of the official. This is primarily board members, but in some cases it could apply to staff. It's a misdemeanor offense to knowingly conspire to circumvent the act by deliberately meeting with less than a quorum for the purposes of a secret meeting, participating in a closed session, knowing there's no agenda of topics or record taken of the meeting, and to knowingly make the results of a legally held closed meeting public. All right, uh, public information is the second part of our open government discussion. The information that is developed and paid for by the RMA is paid for with public dollars, so this is all public information. Um, there are exceptions to what has to be released to the public, and those are outlined here. Um, if we get a request for information, we've got a special form on our website for that request. The request goes directly to Celia, and she and I kind of divide up how we're gonna get that information out. Uh, but we've, we've got a process to comply with the um, Attorney General's guidelines there. Yes? How many requests do we get a year? Wait, not too many. We have five or six. It, you know, if we've got a, we, we just did a procurement last year and that generated a lot of open records requests. That's more than we typically see. I'd say without something like that, we may only see one or two a year. There are some new laws, uh, one from last session that allows suspending pub your public information process, counting those days that you have to respond during a catastrophe. Um, and then in 2023, this past session, there was some additional language adopted providing for greater flexibility in calculating days for a governmental entity, um, allowing the governmental entity to declare certain non-business days. If they're gonna do training or be out for workshops or something, they can, they can hold those days back in calculating their response time. Um, but 
this is really more of a staff issue and, uh, and something that Celia and I can work on directly. With regard to the director's responsibility, you've got an obligation to complete your open records training. Um, avoid using your personal devices and email accounts when conducting RMA business. We've got an obligation to keep your RMA records available to the public if they're requested. And so you've got an RMA email address. That's the best way to keep your records available. Otherwise, if we get a request, we're going to have to ask you to forward all the related documents back to your RMA email. So um, it's easier for all if you'll do your RMA business on that RMA email address. Um, if you are doing business on your personal accounts, then like I said, we would request that you forward those to the RMA server using that email address. You should assume your communications regarding the RMA are public. If you get a request for public information, we ask that you let us know immediately so that we can make sure that we get that in writing and get a timely response. And then we've got to be careful about deleting or destroying records, uh, particularly if we've got a pending uh, Public Information Act request or if we're under a litigation hold. With regard to public information, um, employees are considered temporary custodians of the public's information. And so when they're in the transacting official business or creating or receiving public information, they've got to make sure also that they're not using a personal device. And to the extent you do use a personal device, you also want to forward it to the RMA server. So we've got it for preservation. All right, compliance. This is our final section. So there are certain uh, actually, there's quite a lot of compliance required uh, because of TxDOT. I think some of that's generated by FHWA and other state laws uh, with regard to your ethics obligations. So the first is that we've adopted and we enforce the internal ethics and compliance program that involves the training tonight. Um, and that you can see here, there's a high level personnel responsible for the oversight of the program. It's not to be delegated out. Um, and we effectively communicate to employees and the board um, their obligations under training. And then all of our agents and contract parties are also required to have an internal ethics program. Uh, effective notice for employees says avoid delegation of substantial discretionary authority of individuals who have a propensity to engage in illegal activities. <laughs> says, <laughs> that's not our language, that's the state's language, but. It, yes, so we don't, um, you, we manage the, the compliance program in-house. You've got an, an internal auditor and Celia really manages it and I assist her on that. Um, but, but we haven't, you know, it's not delegated to somebody that's, that doesn't have managerial authority or to a third party that we don't really have oversight of. Um, and if somebody's got a history of any type of issues, then we would remove them from oversight of the program. So the we program- have a, Do we have a vendor vetting process right now? Do we vet vendors and so forth? I'm sure we do. So we do, we work with TxDOT. Okay. Um, and so for the most part, our vendors are all TxDOT certified. Uh, we may have a few that are not, uh, that have come through the county, but for the most part, they're TxDOT certified and they give us a variety of, um, of affidavits and certifications that they've met their obligations on other contracts. We see their litigation history. Um, yeah, we've got we've got quite a process. So the reasonable steps to achieve compliance with our standards and procedures related to the compliance program, we've got a monitoring and auditing system that's designed to reasonably detect noncompliance. This is a button, you see it on the right hand corner on the website. This allows employees, vendors, um, anonymous reporting by the public. If somebody has a concern about the RMA, they can, um, they can file that through the fraud reporting button and that goes directly to Celia Pilar and to me, um, but there's no filter of it. So we all get it um, separately and see it at the same time. And I don't believe, I don't believe we've ever had one every now and then we get a weird kind of phishing thing, but not actually, we've never had any fraud reported on it. Um, okay, so we're required to create a written code of con a written code of conduct that addresses record retention, fraud, equal opportunity employment. 
sexual harassment, misconduct, conflicts of interest, personal use of RMA property, gifts and honoraria. I think a few years back, we also added a section on bullying to this. Um, this written code of conduct is uh, delivered to the staff. It's on the website and it's part of the handbook that we will, um, that I'll describe for you when we get towards the end of this. We're also required to make annual certifications to TxDOT. Um, one that we've had the ethics and compliance program adopted, uh, that the program satisfies the requirements of the state. And then we provide training evidence. That's one more slide down, which includes your open meetings training certificates, your public information act training certificates. Tonight, you'll be given a compliance certificate for this training for you to sign. Um, and then certain members of, of the staff and the board do public information act training and the staff is required to do some additional training from TechStop related to project management and billing. The state also requires a significant number of reports. So we do a, these reports here on the side, the strategic plan is every few years, annual report is every year. We have an annual audit. We do investment reports periodically. Uh, you'll see a project report monthly. We do a total entity finance report to TechStop. I believe that's annual. Notice to the debt, notice of debt to the county is within 90 days of issuing bonds, um, and then so forth. The other, the other certificates and, and disclosure items that we've discussed tonight, and then every April, as board members, you're required to file your annual personal financial statement with the Texas, Texas Ethics Commission. If you've not done that before, you want to give yourself a little bit of time. It's, <laughs> it's broad reaching. Okay, and then our. Our final slide is the Electronic Ethics and Compliance Handbook. So all of the items, all the statutes we've discussed tonight, and then where there is state training, these have been compiled for you. So you've got the original language and information in an electronic handbook. We used to print it and pass it out, but I think nobody wanted to own that much paper. But to the extent you want to search and find something in there, you can do that. If you've got questions, you can also always call me and um, and I'll be glad to walk through those with you. And that's it. Unless you have questions tonight. No? Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I believe, uh, directors, we have uh, Director Reyna on the line. Director Reyna, are you there? And we have quorum. Let me verify he's still on. Do we have to uh, make a motion to elect the temporary yes. chair for this meeting? Yeah. Director Rennick, can you hear us? I believe you're muted. Uh, you're on mute, Director. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm present. OK. So we, we do have quorum uh, board members, but uh, because the chairman is uh, absent and the vice chair position is vacant, uh, the, the board bylaws require that you uh, elect a temporary chairman as we've done in the past. Um, Director Reyna has served as the temporary chairman the last two board meetings. Um, and then of course, any of you can serve as a temporary chairman. Can he do it if he's... Um... Blakey, is it okay that uh, Director Reyna is remote? No. Pilar, the problem is best if, we, if we have somebody that's present. I can't see anybody who's present today. You, you've got uh, Director Kamel, Director Delangel, and you've got the uh, new director, uh, Williamson. Uh, and so that the attorney has recommended that, that we uh, rec re elect uh, one of the board members that's present at the dais. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to uh, elect uh, Director Angel. Uh, as the uh, serving chair for tonight's meeting. Second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 She passes. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's fine. so uh, uh, chairman directors, you do have a quorum. Um, so you proceed with the meeting. Yes, we sir. can proceed. Do we have any public comments? No, sir, we do not. Okay, well then I guess we can go to the reports. Uh, the uh, first item is a report um, 
actually report uh, 1A and 1B. Uh, Ramon Navarro will give a, a report on the 365 tollway project, the IBTC environmental clearance, and then on the uh, construction project. Good evening, directors, uh, chairman. Uh, my name is Ramon Navarro. I'm the chief construction engineer for the Hidalgo County Regional Mobility Authority and providing you with a brief overview of our development activities and our construction activities as stated. Uh, slides are coming up and they would make it a lot easier to be able to uh, transmit the, the documents. Uh, but if, until then, uh, we will continue on. We're having some diff difficulties with the technology, but um, if you were a reference to page four of the uh, of the handout one one a, you will see an overall loop of uh, what in, encompasses our uh, our due diligence, and um, what we are working on is the yellow section, um, which is the 365 toll project. This is a tolled uh, item, and for the sake of Mr. Williams uh, Williamson. IBTC is still in red after Friday, that'll turn to blue. Uh, that project has been uh, totally financed. It has been environmentally cleared. And Friday morning, we have a meeting with TxDOT to make the official transfer of data and smooth that over and hand that project management over to them. And we will be assisting them in any uh, questions or concerns they may have throughout the development process, but they will be the primary project managers on that project. It is scheduled to be let in uh, September of 2026. So we will be diligently working with them and uh, making that transition from project management from us to them. That being stated, uh, going to page 12, you can see an overview of the overall loop and what's next for the RMA. Uh, page 13 will display the uh, Southwest section of the loop, which consists of segment four and Section A West. Uh, staff is going forward with uh, placing this on the thoroughfare plan, working in conjunction with the Rio Grande Valley Metropolitan Planning Organization and through the county to be able to put this on the, uh, the overall thoroughfare plan and uh, moving forth with environmental documents. The thoroughfare plan will ensure that our project alignments are safeguarded from any uh, overall development and uh, efficiently preserve the right of way on the project. Uh, you will also see a section C, uh, which is the northwest section that ties into I-69C. Uh, we are working diligently with the city of McAllen and their MEDC uh, as far as establishing a thoroughfare plan on that route and working also with TxDOT in uh, establishing a connection to the I-69 corridor and possibly financing a project out in that uh, in that area of the county. Moving on to the next slide, you'll see where we, uh, there is a misspelling on the overweight, oversized corridor segments. This is another responsibility we do share uh, with the, uh, with TxDOT. Uh, basically the oversized overweight corridor is overseen by us through a program and uh, issuance and uh, I guess delegation or uh, compliance with the rules and regulations are administered by the DPS. And uh, we simply are administrators of the program and the financing. Uh, you'll see year to date that we have issued approximately 34,551 permits for this year. Uh, the amount collected is approximately $7 million. And you can see how the Alliance share of that goes to TxDOT. We collect approximately 18% of that with 2% going to our project, our program administrator pro miles. And uh, you can see how that is uh, the rationed out as far as the sum of monies. Going on to page 18, you'll see the overall status in a graphic, uh, in a graphic display. And you'll see this month we um, we did maintain an overage of comparison to last year of approximately 124 permits, but this is an annual decline or a seasonal decline with the bridge crossings uh, due to the fruit and uh, et cetera, the, the seasonal uh, crossings on the bridge. And um, we look forward to this uh, going up in the, in the beginning of the year. Uh, other than that, um, this concludes the development report.
May I entertain questions or concerns? I just have a question. Yes, sir. Why in the design section C goes all the way uh, uh, east to connect uh, with the 281? And then the uh, SH-68 goes all the way north uh, up to the 490 connecting to the Edinburgh airport. So why one, I mean, two options. Why the other one doesn't go all the way up to, to 490 or the, or vice versa, the SH-68 goes it's, below, uh, further south. It's a complicated, it's a complicated pre-planning requirement of FHWA that two projects not have the same point of origin. Um, why that is, uh, we've got text dots, um, Mr. Mandelnau in the back that um, may be able, well, for the sake of time, um, because it, it doesn't just, make any through sense, the programming it, and the planning. That's not exactly the loop. It just finishes and the other one finishes. Yeah. So the loop uh, concept was developed in, in 2000, the year 2000, uh, as a county initiative. And so they went back and they looked at the, the county as a whole and they looked at a, a schematic alignment of where the loop could go. We haven't done any studies since then to up, and they had a dog leg. They had an offset between uh, between the section to the east and section to the to the west, and there were some technical reasons for that: an airport and a landfill and some other some environmentally sensitive land. We haven't updated it, and so that's why we still show the offset. But as we go, as 68 goes through the environmental clearance process, and as, as section C goes through the environmental uh, clearance process and we look at a technically what's called a technically preferred alignment at the end of the day they may end up closer than than okay. but that's just based on a study that we did 23 years ago and and that's you know that's the last time we looked at the alignments for the for the corridor overall so let me understand we go through the process of environmental and everything before we have this, this design yes. yes yeah so that's not the final uh, on the section C, that's not the final. That's just, uh, you know, could could maybe probably go through here. But when we go through the environmental clearance, we have to do a, a route study. It has to go through the public involvement process. And we have to select a technically uh, preferred alignment based on a bunch of criteria. And it may not end up where we're showing it. It may end up in a totally different location. And then you don't have to redo the environmental if you're changing the the... Uh, road of the of the corridor. Well, basically, the environmental process establishes the route. The, oh, okay. the, that that's what establishes the route, and that's just based on an old study we did 23 years ago. And they, maybe this is where it should be. So. Thank you, thank you, Pilar. A lot of real quick question, if you don't mind. The, the the items that you just listed right now, the, the items that you need in order to get approved and so forth. Is there any way that you could give us a one pager? Yes, sir. Email yes, sir. that to us or something? Yes, sir. So we have an idea of some of the items yeah. that we need that yeah. you all have to go through. So in, in yes, yeah. we, we can give you a, a, a white white paper that's pretty short and concise. And these are the steps to build the road. And it's actually pretty uh, complicated and lengthy process, but we'll we'll get that to you. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. So we typically see this decline during produce season on the overweight permits. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can see over the years. Well, you just see two graphs, but over the years there is a decline. And is that uh, just because of congestion at the ports with the with the produce trucks, or it's it's seasonal with the fruits or whatever's crossing? So, so the majority of commodity on the that are uh, obtaining overweight permits is produce, and so you we see the peaks during during when they harvest, which is typically begins to increase in January and it peaks around uh, July. And then you see it decline back uh, towards a towards the fall in the winter. And so if we go back and look at all the historical data, it's the same trend. It's a trend. we peak around July and then we decline, and then in January it, it goes back up again. This year, if you look at the graph, we had a huge spike. We had a this is probably our record breaking year for overweight permits issued. So the one commodity we saw that majorly increased is fuel, and we're seeing diesel, gasoline, naphtha. Uh, you know, those types of fuels and th they're obtaining overweight permits and that attributed to the big spike. Any other questions on the development aspect? All right, we'll move on to 1B, construction activities. Uh, primarily, my control now? Yeah, all right. Okay, so... Um, 
as discussed, 365 is a 12.2 mile section of roadway that we are constructing, currently constructing, and this is between the port of Ansaldúas to the port of uh, entry for the city of Far. Uh, we've got various infrastructure um, bridges, and uh, this is an interstate type facility we are constructing. Uh, the award or notice to proceed was issued to Polish Construction, which we formally know as PCI, uh, on February 15th, 2022. And uh, time charges on the project commenced on March 17th of 2022. Um, the work under this contract was uh, issued with the, uh, with the time frame being established of 1,264 calendar days which puts them at September, a due date of September 21st, 2025. And um, this is called a calendar day project because all working days, Sunday through Saturday, including all holidays, with the exception of the five federal holidays are constructed, are considered working days, uh, rain, snow, um, sunshine, whatever it may be, we consider that a, a working day. And uh, the total overall, construction estimate was submitted at $295,932,420.25. We went through what's called a value engineering change proposal or the specifications are in the project to be able to allow the contractor to submit recommendations and proposals to the changes that can increase efficiencies or price uh, improvements to the overall project. Implementing these standards, we were able to save approximately $38 million up, up front. And the first three change orders are all affiliated with the value engineering change proposals. Uh, we did have a change order four that was directly uh, affiliated with the drill shafts on the floodway bridge. It was one that needed to be, it was undersized, it was over and then uh, correctly designed to a 48 inch drill shaft. That was for approximately $171,000. And later we came back with the most recent change order, which was change order five, which captured um, all of the value engineering change proposals in real time. Uh, the savings that the contractor had initially attributed to the 38 million were not realized. Uh, they were short approximately $2.7 million. And that is coming out of the 60% of improvements to our 60% portion of the value engineering change proposal. Uh, we, we've split the savings 60, 60, 40, um, the 60% being that they, they invoke all of the risk with the changes having to do with design, uh, doing the actual engineering of it and et cetera. And that, a, a cost, a cost counted for the 20% increased into the 60%. So um, we can go into detail on that. If you have any further questions, uh, I can entertain it at a different time. Uh, due to time constraints, we will proceed. Um, overall, change order five did impact the, um, the proposed savings and payments, uh, and all of that is broken down. Uh, we did, there is a correction on the 20% that was already paid as far as the progress payment at 4.2 million, we'll have that corrected on the next report. But the overall production payment to the contractor is approximately $8.9 million, $18.9 million, excuse me. As far as project production, we continue on with the VECPs. We continue entertaining uh, requests for information, project submittals on materials. We've received 114 RFIs, 101 submittals. We continue with the environmental justices, uh, this quality control, uh, construction material testing. Overall, we've paid out approximately $84.1 million uh, with uh, payment estimate number 18. And looking over the, uh, the summary of the project, you'll see in the middle of there, 29% um, of production has been uh, constructed with uh, approximately 44% of the time used. We have a 15% deficit, uh, but the contractor is confident that this will be uh, realized or made up before the end of the year. As we go into the, um, into the next year, additional crews will be brought in. They have increased the numbers of workers, and you can see that from the last two months, 
we've been steadily increasing from approximately $3 million estimate to a $5 million estimate. This month's is $7 million. And we look forward to hitting our goals of the 10 to $14 million estimates per month uh, in the next year. Uh, right now we have approximately, I believe we were at 138 and I believe they, they're looking to increase to approximately 250 in the field. A lot of them are, uh, we've got a mixture of, of some floaters that work on pipeline throughout and they come and work in construction. Uh, this is a two and a half um, year left on the project. So uh, a lot of them are, are basically there, you can consider them uh, move, I guess, floaters and they, they go for the dollar and they make the money understandably. Um, with some of the production, you can see retaining walls on the, um, the east end of the project, the southeast end. This is what tying in at uh, the US 281 military highway. This is High Line. Uh, we continue on with uh, construction of substructures, the columns in the floodway, the shafts, you, you can notice we are, uh, we do have a temporary detour along uh, 23rd Street where we are constructing the column in the center bent. And um, you can see a lot of movement going on at South Benson where we are doing improvements to, what, next slide please. There you go. Where we are doing uh, improvements to the infrastructure, we are building substructures, which are everything beneath the slab is considered the substructure. The slab and the bridge crossing itself is considered the superstructure. Uh, we have set beams on five substructures and we have poured the, um, the slab on McCall. McCall is scheduled to be opened uh, the end of next month. We have paving and uh, dressing up with details as far as uh, the roadway itself, the ditches, et cetera, and, and needing up the, uh, the landscaping out there. And we hope that that is on schedule and looking forward to opening that next month. We continue maintaining uh, irrigation structures and drainage structures along the, the project and working closely with the Hidalgo County Irrigation District 2 and 3. Um, these are just uh, soil improvements as we add additives of lime to improve the, the base. And we do have the, uh, the total integration project in progress where they are installing ducts and uh, conduit in the ground. Other than that, that concludes my report. May I entertain questions or concerns at this time? So you Thank you. By the end of the year, we'll be caught up. That's what the contract is saying. They, we had a meeting with them today. They, they uh, did uh, relay to us that the interchange is, uh, is coming to a conclusion as far as the majority of their crews, and they're looking at shifting those over to our project. Yes, uh, we are running. Uh, we are running uh, seven twelves, uh, working seven days a week, twelve hour shifts, and uh, we are. We have been conducting interviews and uh, looking forward to hiring two more staff staffers uh, by the end of the month. Inspectors, sir. Inspectors, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Chairman, Directors, the next item on your agenda is uh, the consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered uh, to be routine by the governing body and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. However, if discussion is desired, that item or items will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Um, the only uh, correction we asked on the consent agenda is uh, item 2C, approval of financial reports. Uh, we only had June. Uh, 2023 ready. July uh, was not quite ready uh, to submit to the board for the packet, so that's the only change. It'll only be for uh, for June of 23. Can I get a motion to approve with uh, the change, Bilad? Real quick question, if you don't mind. I, I was looking over the balance sheet um, on the um, item 2C, and I noticed accounts receivable for uh, VR fees. Uh, what, what, what's our normal accounts receivable aging? I mean, do we carry a long, a long aging on that? No, they're, they're about uh, 30 days behind for, for VRF. Yes, yeah, 30 days. Yeah, it's about 30 days. Yeah. Thank you. 
Can I get a motion to approve uh, with the exception that Bilal noted? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against, same sign. Motion passes. Next item on your agenda is item uh, under regular agenda is item 3A, resolution 2023-37, consideration and approval of work authorization number 14 to the professional service agreement with CNM Associates to provide a revised bring down letter for volumetric tolling for the 365 tollway. What a bring down letter is, is basically uh, an update to the traffic and revenue study. And so what we're asking, staff is uh, asking for uh, the board to approve is to update the traffic and revenue study the the TNR is currently based on what's called axle tolling and so what we do is we measure the number of axles a vehicle has and then based on that you determine the classification is it a passenger car is it a truck is it a is it a um is it a five axle truck um is it a, a six axle truck the the problem with with uh, axle tolling is that it can't tell the difference between say like a FedEx or a UPS, which is a truck, it's only got two axles. So it'll misclassify it as a passenger car, thinking it's a passenger car when it's a truck. Volumetric tolling is what we're, we're proposing to use on the project, actually measures the length, the width, and the height of the vehicle so it can accurately uh, determine what the vehicle is and it doesn't get mis misclassified and it allows you for more uh, classifications which means at the end of the day, it means we should have a higher volume because we're, we're more accurately uh, counting the vehicles correctly and tolling them for whether it's a passenger car or a, or a truck. Um, so we're asking for our financial model to be updated using volumetric tolling um, because that's what we're proposing to use on the toll integration side for the project. Um, and so this um, CNM who is, who, who is our traffic and revenue uh, consultant um, is proposing to do for the work for us um, and we're proposing to do it in the amount of uh, $74,268 uh, even. Uh, there's a lot of data collection that has to go on out in the field um, so they, ba they basically got to go out and, and count trucks so that they can update uh, based on the current uh, volumes, vehicle volumes that are out there. The last time we did a bring down letter was in 20, 2021, late 2021 so um, it's a good time to update it just to see what the trends are. And number two, we need this information uh, because one of the things that we have to do, uh, our debt was issued um, to the bondholders based on, on axle tolling and we'll have to disclose to them that we're changing to volumetric tolling. Um, and so this bring down letter will, will confirm the, that basically volumetric tolling is advantageous as compared to axle tolling. Uh, or make the suggestion or the recommendation to change uh, to volumetric tolling based on what margin or what increase of potential revenue? Yes, sir. So so th there's there's a couple of advantages to volumetric tolling. Number one, it should increase our revenue, right? Because there's less error in the in the tolling of the vehicles, counting of the vehicles. Number two, it, re it reduces our maintenance uh, on the roadway because with axle tolling, we have to have uh, what are called inductive loops in the pavement. So we've got to go cut and place sensors in the pavement. With volumetric tolling, there are no sensors in the pavement. It's just equipment that hangs on the gantries that we are already doing um, you know, with the, with the uh, video cameras and the video detection uh, system. So at the end of the day, it, it, uh, it uh, is a reduction in maintenance and operation also beside, on top of the increase in revenue. So. Make that vote. To move forward with the volumetric to tolling, we need to at least see maybe who else is using it. Yes. Uh, in the state, you know, yeah. things like that. And, and is there a downside to that technology, you know, type of thing? Right. Like yeah. Is? And and it's, uh, and yes, sir, we could provide that information. It, it is an industry trend, volumetric tolling. Um, and that's that's why they're recommending. One of the things with with uh, tolling is the technology is constantly changing. It's just, just like you're, you know, you buy a laptop and two, three years is obsolete. Tolling is the same thing. In our in our plan, we have to replace our equipment at year seven or eight. Um, our our all our electronic equipment and that is part of our. Um, but step one is to get a handle on the revenue, and that's why we're asking to 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 get a handle on the revenue so that we can come back and make a recommendation to the to the board. And say this is why it's advantageous. Look, here here's the revenue with axle tolling. Here's the revenue with volumetric tolling. So this is the study that will determine what yeah. that difference is. Yeah, it'll show that it's advantageous. My question, Pilar, is 
does this have any impact or trigger anything on the equipment that was already included in the CSE contract for, no. the, for so, the tolling mechanisms? So basically the contract you awarded to CSE is a design build. Um, okay. We had performance requirements and how they did it. You know, the contractor had to propose the equipment. We didn't call out any equipment ahead of time. We just gave them the performance uh, parameters that they needed to meet, the accuracies, leakage, uh, all the tolling Te industry technical. stuff. And so they had to design it to meet that that requirement. They're using a lot of off-the-shelf equipment, um, and there's some proprietary stuff in there, but most of it's off-the-shelf equipment that we can buy um, as, far, as far as maintenance concerned. So this is actually one of the recommendations they're recommending is saying, okay. this is something we're recommending you look at, um, where, we're, where we're having to do our due diligence is on the financing side of things because we've issued the debt, we've got to disclose it to the bondholders, we've got to have and we've, you know, we've got to have some numbers to back that up that we're, you know, we can't just say, well, we, we think it's going to perform better. We need to, we need to have some data behind that. So. Since if I may, uh, since we're changing or increasing the amount of the project by seven, and this is a small amount, $74,000, um, is this uh, over budget or is it variance or do you have an amount already that's, uh, Reserve in here that they can take care of these? Yes, sir. So so this is within, we did have uh, funds programmed in the project budget to go out, do periodic. Um, the, basically, this is coming out of our, our general engineering, what we call our general engineering for the budget. So that's kind of the oversight on the budget, the consultants that we have oversight on. So we're, we're taking that out of that budget. So you think that this, this study will provide an additional $74,000 in revenue to pay for this additional Oh, we're hoping it's way more than that. We're hoping it's way more than this, uh, director. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions? Can I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. I got a motion. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's against. Same sign. Motion passes. Okay. The next item on your agenda is item 3B, resolution 20, 2023-38, consideration and approval of the contract amendment number 16 to the professional service agreement with CNM Associates to increase the maximum payable payable amount for work authorization number 14. So you just approved the work authorization. This is just to increase the maximum payable account. I mean, maximum payable amount for for uh, CNM Associates. So their um, their current maximum payable amount is $852,190.20 with the work authorization that you just approved in the amount of $74,268, that'll take their maximum payable amount to $926,458.20. Staff recommends approval. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. I got a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Again, same sign, motion passes. I do have a quick question on that. If we are getting up to our limits with some of these vendors or some of these uh, project uh, managers, project uh, uh, consultants and so forth, any vendor we have, do you bring in a list at any time and say we're getting a little close to that maximum amount that we can provide them? Or so That's why we bring the contract amount so that you can we can increase the maximum payable amount. Okay. So so right now, with this action, we're capped at the 900000 unless the board approves an increase out of, all, out of all of our vendors right now or all the folks that we pay how many are we close to that cap all, uh, all of them i mean all of them have been authorized to a, a maximum payable amount I, I, I think the question is if we're uh, gonna go over our budgeted amount right is that going to be brought to our attention or is yeah like say for example we have 100 vendors let's say just say a simple number 100 how many of those are close right now to their maximum limit. So, so right now we only have probably one vendor uh, or two vendors that are are approaching their maximum payable amount, which is our G general engineering consultant HDR, and our uh, environmental uh, consultant, which is um, used to be Blantness, IFC. They just they became IFC. Um, those are approaching their maximum payable amounts, but the way we uh, operate, uh, director, is that. The board only authorizes work on a work authorization basis. So we don't give them a, just say, well, we're going to give you a million dollars and we figure out how we're going to spend it along the way. It is task based. So if they've got a maximum payable amount, there's tasks already assigned uh, that the board has approved that they perform. And we don't we don't have an unassigned uh, balance that we, OK, let's figure out what to spend the next hundred thousand on. Uh, you've already decided that and, and assigned it. 
question for you, just out of curiosity now. Are the contracts time and expense or fixed fee once we once we ask and time and expense? Sorry. Okay. Um, and then the last item of your agenda uh, is uh, 4A is election of a vice chairman for the Hidalgo County Regional Mobility Authority Board of Directors. So the chairman is appointed by the governor. Uh, however, the the vice chairman and the secretary treasurer are uh, are elected from amongst the board of directors. Currently, uh, Director Reyna serves as the secretary treasurer and former uh, uh, board member Forrest Runnels was the vice chair elected by the board of directors. So the vice chair position, uh, and he was reelected in, I believe it was May, uh, April or May of this year. And since he vacated the position and director uh, Williamson has replaced him, we now have a vacancy for the vice chairman's position. And so it's the pleasure of the board who they'd like to elect as the vice chairman. Does everyone up here know what the vice chairman does? Uh, I think he fills this position if the chairman's not here, <laughs> pretty much. Um, Director Reyna, any thoughts? Uh, I don't know, guys. Uh, there's four of us right now here, so. Do you want to remain secretary or would you like to be vice chair? It doesn't matter to me, gentlemen. Whatever y'all think, you know, uh, almost everybody's new on the board except Frank and I. Whatever you all think, uh, Pilar, it doesn't matter to me. I'll serve as vice president. I, I can stay as secretary, treasurer, it doesn't matter. Uh, all right, Director Reyna, as vice chair, would we have to bring another agenda item next time? For yes, sir. We'll, at next board meeting, we'll bring uh, secretary, treasurer. Okay. Um, I make a motion to elect Director Reyna as vice chair. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against, same sign. Motion passes. Congratulations, uh, Vice Chairman Reyna. Am I supposed to say thank you? <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah. So, uh, Chairman, Directors, we have no further business for your consideration. Uh, nothing in executive session? No, sir. So we're good. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I got a, can I get a second? Second. I got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay.